Welcome to the Black Media Man Cave, and welcome to my top 10 favorite In Living Color sketches. In Living Color is a show that occupies a very big space in my heart because it was one of the few shows growing up that was considered mandatory family time in my household. My moms and I watched every single episode without fail, even some of the terrible ones from the final season, and it was my first introduction to most of the cast and to sketch comedy. In Living Color wasn't the first black sketch comedy show, or even the first variety show, but it was the first to successfully blend comedy that appealed to a variety of audiences with a mostly black cast and from a black point of view. Something that couldn't be said of its predecessors, like Saturday Night Live. In Living Color went out of its way to be a more hip and relatable show than SNL ever was, mostly by catering to a younger demographic. But that's not to say that everybody could see this vision from the start. The one man who knew exactly what he wanted from the show was his creator, Keenan Ivory Wayans. And the beginnings of what later became known as In Living Color started a lot earlier than you probably realized. As kids, Keenan and his brother Damon would pretend to be different characters in their Manhattan neighborhood to entertain their friends. Sometimes they would pretend to be two thieves who could get you anything you need and other times they would pretend to be two gay men who critiqued whatever was popular at the time. It goes without saying that Keenan, Damon, and really the whole Wayans family showed early signs of being extremely talented. And it's this realization that eventually led to Keenan dropping out of Tuskegee College and making his way to California along with longtime friend Robert Townsend. He honed his craft in comedy clubs and improv groups for a while before getting the opportunity of a lifetime to perform on a Tonight Show. The stand-up was a success and it helped Keenan land roles on short-lived TV shows and small movies. I've already covered some of Keenan and Robert Townsend's history in previous videos. But along with Paul Mooney, Arsenio Hall, and Eddie Murphy, they collectively became known as the Black Pack, a group of comedians trying to make a name for themselves in Hollywood while also helping each other out along the way. One good example of this was when Eddie Murphy gave Keenan the idea for the movie I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, a movie that its own studio didn't even believe in. But despite a critical beatdown, the movie defied all odds and was a financial success making Keenan a household name and setting him up with the leverage he needed to pitch a brand new TV show. As Keenan puts it, he didn't even want to make TV shows. His heart was in making movies. But when a new startup station named Fox came to him and basically offered him full creative freedom on a new show, it didn't take much to convince him to take on the challenge. See, Fox needed fresh and entertaining content to try to compete with the big three networks and also to be taken seriously. So they were willing to gamble on all kinds of unique ideas. Show business is kind of funny. While researching for this video, no less than five different people took credit for the idea of In Living Color. Nobody can agree on who came up with what, right down to the name of the show. One guy says it all started out being called Urban Renewal, which admittedly kind of sucks. Keena says he wanted to use the name Live in Color based on the old NBC slogan, but somebody told him it wouldn't be wise to use the word live to avoid comparisons to Saturday Night Live. Then finally someone decided that it should be named In Living Color, really only because the band Living Color had debuted around that same time and their song, What's Your Favorite Color, was a popular song on the album. They even kind of ripped off the song for the show's theme song. Seriously, go listen to it and tell me otherwise. Hey, I'm not the only one who thought it was confusingly similar either because the band sued over the name, the logo, and the song. Basically, when it comes to this show, everybody seems to want to take credit for the good stuff. Like the old saying goes, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. Another way that Keenan wanted to set the show apart was by giving it a hip-hop vibe, something never done before. Originally, there was a legit DJ at the start of every show, but eventually, it was decided that Keenan's brother Sean would pretend to be a DJ instead, for aesthetic purposes. The show also had a steady stream of rap performances at the end of most episodes from new and established artists, and was responsible for giving exposure to rap groups that may have otherwise stayed underground. And perhaps its most important innovation was that of the Fly Girls. Keenan insisted that the show feature women dancing in between the sketches and solicited the help of actress and choreographer A.J. Johnson to help with the dancers. They were rumored to be dating at the time, and Johnson admits that when she eventually chose to star in House Party, instead of doing a living color, it strained their relationship a little. She was briefly replaced by Carla Early, who didn't work out, 
and the show eventually settled on dancer and actress Rosie Perez to be the permanent leader for four seasons. But that's enough history for now. Everything was in place for In Living Color to be one of the most iconic and funniest shows on TV. All it needed now was a cast, but I'll be getting to that in a second. This list will double not only as a top 10 sketches list, but also a top 10 cast members list. So without further delay, here is my top 10 favorite In Living Color sketches. Number 10, Chris Rock, Cheat Pete at the Convenience Store. I know a sizable collective of you just went, what? I don't remember Chris Rock being on In Living Color, but yep, Rock joined the cast in the final season after a somewhat lackluster stint on Saturday Night Live. I could have easily put Kim Coles in this spot also. And the rest of you just went, Kim Coles was on this show? Yes but she was unceremoniously fired after season one. Chris Rock was a longtime friend of the Wayans brothers and even admits that Damon Wayans taught him more about stand-up than anybody else. However, with the departure of the entire Wayans family prior to season five, Fox felt as though they needed more black comedians to maintain the authenticity of the show and Chris Rock was high on the list of people to choose from. Tired of being the token black guy on SNL, only really used when they needed a black man to be stereotypical, Rock jumped at the idea of being part of a show that was synonymous with black culture. Only problem was, by this point, the majority of the writers responsible for the show's success was long gone, so they really didn't know what to do with Rock. So they had him fall back on a character that he had already played on I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. How am I full of soda? 75 cents. 75 cents, good lord! And that's pretty much the only character that he played the entire season. Now it's easy to be critical of that, but personally, I feel like the character had legs and was liked enough to continue in this format, especially opposite Tommy Davidson. You're gonna take 11 cents out of there. This is for people with muscular dystrophy. All right. How about I give you seven cent and come down with sick of sale? <laughs> There's not many good things to say about the final season of In Living Color, but Cheap Pete is a rare highlight. <laughs> Number nine, Kelly Caulfield, Sheila Peace. Kelly Caulfield's entry into In Living Color is one of the most interesting backstories of the cast. By her own admission, she was not a comedian hadn't done any stand-up, and had no improv experience. She was just an actress, a dramatic one at that, who had only been doing theater in Chicago up until the day that her agent convinced her to audition for In Living Color. She flew to LA, and upon arriving at the comedy club, she was immediately intimidated by all the comedians, and was still convinced that they picked the wrong woman. Undeterred by this, she went on stage anyway, and proceeded to play a bunch of characters in a women's support group where the main character was Sleeping Beauty. And the way she tells it, the audience died with laughter, but she couldn't tell if they were laughing at her and her act, or if they were just laughing at her for being so whack. A few weeks later, she received a call saying she made it on the show. Now being the token white woman on the show had its perks. Caulfield was able to play a wide variety of characters with the kind of authenticity that many of the black women probably couldn't have pulled off and you can make the argument that Caulfield was the best character actor on the show. She was also able to play characters that accurately displayed some of the racial attitudes of the time, and no other character drives that home more than my personal favorite character of hers, Sheila Peace. In her first appearance as Peace, Caulfield doesn't miss a beat as an extremely racist real estate agent who tries to make an apartment appealing to visitors, but the only way she knows how to appeal is by using stereotypes. This locale is ideal for you. There is a golden bird fried chicken right down on the corner. And you know something? There is a crack house over on 7th. The sketch is smarter than it appears because the way Kelly Caulfield plays it gives off the impression that Sheila has no idea that she actually is racist as hell, but it's just rambling off a bunch of perks, quote unquote, that she thinks the people can relate to. Oh, hold on, this apartment is just perfect for you. Here you are on the first floor. You won't disturb anyone down below with that karate stuff. And there's a photo mat right across the street. 
That smile she keeps on her face the entire time just shows how oblivious she is to everything. And it's a spot on representation of many real life people like her who refuse to think outside of the perfect little box they live in. That's why Sheila Peace is my favorite Kelly Caulfield character. Number 8, Takiya Crystal Kima, LaShawn the Museum Guide. Just like Kelly Caulfield, Takiya Kima was also an actress in Chicago who also didn't consider herself a comedian. On top of that, she openly admits she didn't like the movie I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. Well damn, talk about not being off to a good start. Regardless, she showed up to the audition anyway and in what feels like a brazen display of defiance, performed a one-woman show she had written called Black World in which she portrayed a young girl who imagined a world where there was no violence or racism. The black leaders controlled all the businesses and they led all the nations. And she had a real black baby doll with real black people hair. There were funny aspects to it, but it was decidedly not funny and more sentimental than anything else. Despite this, Keenan Ivory Wayans loved it, especially with how well acted it was, and Kima was added to the show. The Black World skit itself was turned into a sketch on the show in season one, but that's not the one I picked for my favorite. Takiya Kima played a lot of memorable characters on the show, including one half of Haymarn, where she was the wife in a family of hard-working Jamaicans with no less than three jobs apiece. She also played a character named Shawanda Harvey, who hosted her own feminist show called Go On Girl, and I came very close to putting Go On Girl as my favorite, but instead I had to go with LaShawn where Kima plays a sassy sister from the hood who provides absolute garbage customer service while doing various jobs over multiple seasons. She's been seen as a fast food worker, a beauty shop employee, and even a makeup artist. But my favorite sketch is when she was a museum exhibit tour guide. Mostly because how the hell did she even get this job? And secondly because I think this is Kima playing the character at its absolute peak. I'm so sorry. I was just admiring that beautiful piece of work back there. Did you realize that the Cherokee Indians uh -huh. never even... Look, I'm sure you came here with a wealth of information to share with us today. But uh, if you don't mind, your trip to Little Bighorn is not on my schedule. The character works because we all know a LaShawn. There is at least one at damn near every place you can think of, so that makes her instantly relatable. And considering the wide range of characters that Takiya Kima plays on the show, LaShawn, at least to me, is the most believable. Oh, oh no, you don't come in here with that. Does this look like your home? Do you see rats and roaches and an eviction sign somewhere? <laughs> Number 7, Kim Wayans, Bonita Portrayal Block Captain. Of all the Wayans family members on A Living Color, the one who was more destined to become a star than any of them was Kim Wayans. That's because as kids, Kim would perform in front of friends and family and was the only one to actually do things like school musicals, community plays, and dance recitals. So her growing up to be a fixture on her brother's show was a no-brainer. Over the years, Keenan has been criticized for hiring so many of his family members for his projects, and in his defense, he made each and every one of them audition for their roles. Yeah, that's cute and all, but there's no way that anybody else would have gotten these roles. Let's be clear. Audition or not, Kim Wayans was more than suited to be a part of the show, and she was at the center of several memorable characters, including a bunch of musical parodies, Mr. and Mrs. Brooks, a couple who hate each other but still stay together, and a filthy, damn near deaf waitress at the Snackin' Shack. But perhaps her best known character is Bonita Betrayal, a loudmouthed old neighborly woman who spends all day gossiping about other people. Girl, I see why your mama call you Easterly. With that perfume you wear, smell like a basket of fresh Easter flowers. <laughs> basket of rotten Easter eggs is more like it. Girl think all she got to do is throw some perfume on top of stank and everything's okay. <laughs> Smell so funky you can smell over the telephone. But I ain't one to gossip, so you ain't heard it from me. Bonita Betrayal was based on several old ladies in the Wayans childhood neighborhood, who they said would always be nice to them in their face, but then be negative the minute they walked off. I think we all know an old lady like that, who sat on the porch and knew everything about everybody's business in the neighborhood. As Bonita Betrayal, Kim Wayans talks to the audience as if we were somebody who she was meeting for the first time and darts back and forth from pleasant niceties to outright slander in the blink of an eye. If Miss Bonita was just 15 years younger and had all my strength, Lord knows what I'd do. 
I'd beat the crap out of that little hustler. That's what I'd do. And he, I noticed you shook his hand. You better count your fingers and make sure they're still there. The only person in the hood that she actually respects is another lady named Miss Jenkins, who she dares anybody to say something bad about. But you remember how your mom used to say she could talk about you all she wants, but nobody else better say anything bad about you. I think that perfectly sums up Bonita Betrayal's relationship with Miss Jenkins. No, nobody better say nothing bad about Miss Jenkins because that's when Bonita loses. it. That's when Bonita goes off. Just don't let her take a wig off. Head so bald you can see her thoughts. <laughs> but I ain't one of the gossip zoo. You ain't heard that from me. Number six, Tommy Davidson, Luther the Cook. Tommy Davidson is one of the most well-known names from the show, but if you examine his history, it's more of a testament to his charisma and stage presence than his utilization on the show. Davidson initially turned down the opportunity to audition for In Living Color, but that pesky agent again convinced him to give it a shot. He admits that he kind of bombed the audition, but just like Kelly Caulfield, they liked him, and he was the one chosen out of 30 applicants. As the show went on, Davidson lamented at the fact that he never really had any parts written for him, and he was mostly relegated to bit parts or background parts, which I initially thought couldn't be true, but then I went back and watched the show, and he's right. With the exception of maybe prison game show host Angel Martinez, and multiple sketches as one half of the BS Brothers with David Allen Greer, Davidson was usually either a side character or had very small appearances. He did finally get his own character named Sweet Tooth Jones, but it was during the ill-fated fifth and final season. That being said, his small appearances were excellent, and it's the reason that he's remembered just as fondly as the rest of the cast, despite not having a signature character of his own. My favorite is Luther the Cook, who appears in several of the Snack and Shack skits. In it, Davidson plays a near-deaf chef who can't get the orders right because he cooks only what he thinks he hears. Rule number three. Black eyed peas, pick them up. Hello. Hello. Jello, pick it up. The speed at which he produces the orders is what puts it over the top, and it gets progressively funnier with each appearance. I think the best one is the episode in season two when Kelly Caulfield gets a job at the shack as a new waitress. She is in way over her head, and Luther not being able to hear her orders certainly doesn't help. Even as a background character, Luther the Cook is as good as it gets. Number 5. David Allen Greer Al McAfee, Mick Berger, Security Guard David Allen Greer already had a relationship with Keenan and several other comedians prior to In Living Color, and even had a small role in I'm Gonna Get You Sucker and A Soldier Story with Robert Townsend. It may sound like a broken record at this point, but once again, just like Kima and Caulfield, Greer was not a comedian and instead was a graduate of Yale School of Drama and had already been nominated for a Tony Award prior to his audition. Just like Davidson, he also turned down the opportunity to be on the show before being talked into it by Keenan Wayans. As Greer puts it, he considered himself to be a more serious actor and although he knew he could be funny, he didn't really have a bunch of characters ready to do for the show. That last line is perhaps why it's kind of hard for me to narrow down the best David Allen Greer sketch. He was one of the best cast members on the show, evident by the fact that he's one of the few who stayed through all five seasons, and although he had a bunch of good characters, it felt like he was a master at none. That's not a knock, it's just to say that he was very versatile. I could have picked Calhoun Tubbs here, where Greer plays an old blues singer whose songs are never longer than 13 seconds. Wrote a song about it, like the kid, here it go. I could have been a dead paw bomb in Mississippi, but I couldn't even afford the dirt. I also could have used Men on Film here, which is one of the best sketches on the entire series because of the chemistry between Damon Wayans and David Allen Greer. We have a brand new sponsor, Ballpark Franks. They plump when you heat them. That they do. They almost can't fit into the bun. 
But instead, I decided to go with Al McAfee McBurger Security Guard. Al McAfee started on the show as a teacher at a high school who was intended to be an over-the-top parody of Joe Clark, the famous principal who was the subject of the movie Lean On Me. He carries a megaphone and has a bad hip and will regularly harass students and teachers in the hallways in between class, greatly exaggerating how respected he is. By season three, the character was established enough that they started putting him in other situations outside of the school, and the best one of these is the one when he somehow gets a job as a security guard at a fast food restaurant. Hey, I'm not done with that yet. My retainer was on that truck. Oh, hold it right there, Missy. Don't make me chase you. You want a hamburger? Now you'll march right up there to the counter and you pay for it. It's not so much different from the other school versions, but you can tell that Greer had fully invested into the character at this point. Oh, glory be. <laughs> Ruthie, my own special sauce. Guess you got yourself a Big Mac attack, didn't you, honey? Boy, I'd like to be a caboose on this love train. <laughs> right up on it. Unfortunately, the character doesn't age well, but what old school sketch comedy character does these days? Number four, Keenan Ivory Wayans. Frenchie, what more can be said about Keenan Ivory Wayans? He's the man who created and hosted the show, and for the first three and a half seasons, all ideas and sketches ran through him. But he didn't put the burden of keeping the show funny all on other people. He himself participated in multiple sketches and was just as talented as anybody else on the cast. Keenan was a part of a bunch of sketches early on and it's nearly impossible to pick a favorite because they were all funny. He had the Homeboy Shopping Network in which he and his brother Damon played a couple of five finger discount dealers and was a precursor to the movie Mo Money. He sometimes impersonated Arsenio Hall, which led to real life friction between the two. And he and Damon came together again for the Brothers Brothers skits, where they play a pair of brothers oblivious to their lack of understanding of black social issues. Well, it's New Jack City, New uh -huh. Jack City uh -huh. and iced tea. Oh, we don't have any iced tea. We have some Kool-Aid. We got the red kind. You know, I like that, don't you? I came real close to choosing one of the Brothers Brothers skits as a favorite here, but I had to give the slight edge to Frenchie. The character Frenchie has a hell of a backstory. Back in the 80s, Keenan was hanging out at Eddie Murphy's house before they decided to head to a nightclub. And while there, he ended up stumbling on a closet full of ugly outfits that fans had sent Eddie Murphy over the years. Always seeing a joke in every situation, Keenan decided to wear one of the outfits along with a bad wig and a sausage in his pants, looking like a bad impersonation of Rick James. He then pretended to be Eddie's cousin Frenchie from Augusta, Georgia the entire night. Unfortunately, by pure chance, he ended up running into the real Rick James, who took a liking to what he thought was a legitimate family member to Eddie and the life of the party. Long story short, Keenan ended up in a limo with Rick James and had to play the character the entire night. The Frenchie on In Living Color isn't very different from the story from that night, minus the sausage. And the only difference is that this Frenchie is meant to be an annoying friend with some amazing detective skills who always seems to find his way into Tommy Davis's life. How the hell did you find me? Oh, Trace and Play. When you accidentally threw my number in the trash can, I ran outside and took down your license plate number. Then I called the DMV. They give me an ex-wife last name. I call her. I talked to her for five minutes. You know what she say? Hear the address, hear the telephone number, he's going down there. She said, me and you deserve each other, man. The episode where he's the most funny to me is his first appearance, where he shows up at his friend's Save the Dolphins event and either ruins the party or becomes the life of it, depending on your perspective. Keenan's delivery is rapid fire as he works the room from person to person, responding to snobby comments in a way that's most relatable to him. Yeah, the bonjour, mon derrière. <laughs> hey, Bruce Lee. As I was saying, I received my BA from SMU yes. and my PhD from uh -huh. MIT. I have you know that I bought my BLT from Mickey D. Get all my JMB from the AMP and once got VD and DC. For a character that was only meant to be a spur of the moment joke, I think it's Keenan's most entertaining and most fleshed out character on the whole show. Number three, Jamie Foxx, Ugly Woman Blind Date. Jamie Foxx didn't join the In Living Color cast until season three, 
After doing the rounds on the comedy circuit for years, as Keenan Ivory Wayans recalls, Jamie Foxx was really a singer who did comedy just so he could get on stage and sing, which is insane to me because if you've ever seen a Jamie Foxx stand-up, he's a natural. He's always been funny and a jack of all trades when it comes to entertainment. I guess Keenan knows better than I do because Jamie Foxx supposedly was bombing the improv portion of the auditions for season three and purposely showed up late to the stand-up portion to ensure he was ready. During his routine, he broke out a routine about a hypersexualized woman named Wanda, who was the only person in the world who didn't realize she was unattractive. The routine killed, and once Jamie made the show, Keenan put him in a hideous blonde wig and gave him a fake ass to accentuate the ridiculousness of the character. In many ways, this character put Jamie Foxx on the map, and even though he had some other characters like the journeyman boxer Carl the Tooth Williams and Cornbread Turner, an old man who refused to believe his dog Duke is dead, none reached the heights in popularity as Wanda. The character Wanda first appeared in a seldom remembered short sketch that was a commercial for a device to get out of an ugly situation. But my favorite is when she got her own full-fledged sketch in season three, when she went on a blind date with Tommy Davidson. Damn! Oh, wait, 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 wait. Davidson and Fox as Wanda ended up developing amazing chemistry together throughout the remainder of the show and this first encounter sets the tone for things to come because it feels ad-libbed and realistic and like they were just playing off each other. You better be glad this ain't no liquor cause come 12 o'clock I turn into a wolf. <laughs> Must be a quarter to one. They eventually started putting Wanda in all kinds of crazy scenarios, including one when she broke an R&B groups in Vogue's dressing room and another when she was trying to find the father of her child. But I don't think any of them were as impactful as this first appearance. Get my number. Call me. I'll rock your world. <laughs> Number two, Jim Carrey, Vortex of Fear. Of all the cast members of In Living Color, Jim Carrey is far and away the most successful, at least as far as acting goes. At one point in the 90s, he was the highest paid actor in Hollywood, so it's not crazy to say that he's the most successful cast member post In Living Color. Prior to all that, however, he was kind of a struggling actor in Hollywood. He had already been in LA 10 years and had only done one TV show and three mediocre movies, one of which was Earth Girls Are Easy, which he starred in with Damon Wayans. It was Damon who recommended Carrie to Keenan. By this point, Carrie had already been turned down by Saturday Night Live multiple times and had an appearance on The Tonight Show canceled after they saw one of his bad shows, so he was down bad by the time he auditioned for In Living Color. Even then, he wasn't even the first choice. Believe it or not, they picked Adam Sandler over him originally, but Sandler wasn't available and ended up joining SNL. Jim Carrey impressed everybody with his impressions and his ability to improvise, and that translated well to the show when it came to apply them to the multitude of characters that Carrey played. It's almost impossible to pick a favorite of Carrey's characters because all of them are funny. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. It would have been easy for me to pick Fire Marshal Bill, a half-dead fireman who puts himself through pure torture to teach fire safety. And that's usually the first character that comes to mind when you think of Jim Carrey on the show. Have you got a light? Coming right up, hot stuff. <laughs> put another shrimp on the barbie, baby. It also would have been easy to pick Vera DeMilo, a muscle-bound, deep-voiced, obviously on steroids, female bodybuilder, based off a woman that Carrie saw at a gym once. Live fast, die young and pretty. <laughs> I actually came very close to picking background guy, where Carrie plays every weird guy in the background of a news report, just trying to do anything to show off of the camera. But I ultimately landed on a small little known sketch called Vortex of Fear, which was a parody of the Twilight Zone. In this episode, David Allen Greer plays a hypnotist who hypnotizes a businessman, played by Carrie, to act like a chicken. Unfortunately, the hypnotist dies of a heart attack before he can turn Carrie back, and as a result, he's stuck that way and has his life ruined. The part that cracks me up is watching Carrie try to adjust to life while sounding like a chicken. Bacon! 
The man just wants something to eat, but he can't quite figure it out. Even with Takiya Kima and Kim Coles trying to help him the best way they know how. Can you write it down? That's a great idea. I should have thought of this. Starving. Chicken scratch. <laughs> this was the first glance into what Jim Carrey would ultimately become and one of his funniest little known sketches on the show. <laughs> Number one, Damon Wayans. Anton Jackson at the Army Recruitment Office. If you grew up watching and living color, then number one should not be a surprise to you. Damon Wayans was without a doubt the funniest cast member and the MVP of the show. And if you don't believe that, then consider the fact that when he returned after his movie career didn't work out, Fox made him the highest paid person on the show just to return. Hey, if that's not enough to convince you, then what about the fact that when Damon left again during season four, after Keenan decided to call it quits, the show went into a steep decline since he basically took all of his characters with him. Yeah, you could have gotten somebody else to play them, but let's be for real. Damon was not only the funniest and most talented cast member, but he was also arguably the best stand-up comedian on the show. Everybody from Chris Rock to Jim Carrey credits Damon Wayans with improving the way they did stand-up. If a glowing endorsement from one of the greatest comedians ever and one of the highest paid men in Hollywood isn't enough, then I don't know what is. As far as the show goes, Damon was essentially grandfathered into it since the characters he created with his brother Keenan were precursors to the show's whole existence. Characters like Men on Film and the Homeboy Shopping Network were all based off characters they did as kids. On top of that, Damon brought life to a bunch of other characters like Homie D Clown, an ex-convict on parole who had to take a job as a clown to satisfy his community service. That's not very pretty! Damn right it ain't. <laughs> By the looks of your face, neither is your mama. Now sit down. The character is constantly mean to the kids and always blames his situation on the man. He was loosely based on comedian Paul Mooney, who wrote for the show during this time. And it was said that Paul Mooney was essentially the real life homie the clown because he would always use the catchphrase, homie don't play that. Then he had characters like Handyman, a handicapped superhero that actually got high praise from the handicapped community and that Damon felt comfortable doing because he himself had a club foot. There's Haymon, there's Head Detective, the Brothers Brothers, the Televangelist, the Farrakhan impersonation, the smart dumb prisoner Oswald Bates, the episode where he played a slave in modern times. It just goes on and on and on. They were working the shit out of Damon Wayans. No wonder he wanted more money. I almost went with a three-way tie here with the men on film and homie the clown. But I think his most enduring character is Anton Jackson. Anton Jackson was so popular that he actually was featured on Saturday Night Live when Damon Wayans hosted once. Which is ironic because Damon was fired from that show years earlier when he decided to go off script. Anton Jackson is a homeless man who either has no self-awareness as to how filthy he is or is secretly a genius who grosses people out to the point where they give him money to go away. Now you probably want the eternal life mission. It's down the street and around the block. No, I'll come to be all I can be. Cause I've been what I've been and it ain't paying too well. I think the funniest Anton Jackson sketch is when he decided to join the army. David Allen Greer is forced to play the straight man and he's a real pro because there's no way I would have been able to keep a straight face no matter how many takes it was. Maggot! Maggot? Hey, I ain't no maggot. Hey, I ain't never been with another man before. Who told you that, Clarence? He's lying. He's lying. I'm telling you. All right, once. I was desperate. I needed the money. I was drunk and down out. Don't hold it. I don't have it. It's rare when every single joke on the sketch lands, but this is one of those rare times when everything just lands. And without Damon, I don't think it would have went nearly as well. All right, here's 25. Just go. 25, get you 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45. Oh, hey, hey. That's why Damon Wayans is my pick for the number one funniest cast member and why this is my favorite of his sketches. Which in Living Color sketch is your favorite sketch? Let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and turn on notifications. Also, tell your friends about my channel. It'll really help me grow.
Until next time, I'll holler at you.